This is NASA TV. Good afternoon from NASA's Johnson Space Center and welcome to NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 Crew News Conference. We are joined here today by the four astronauts from Crew-4, NASA astronauts Chell Lindgren, Bob Hines, and Jessica Watkins, as well as European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 mission is set to launch aboard the Crew Dragon Freedom spacecraft on a Falcon 9 rocket to the International Space Station from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The commander of the Crew-4 mission is Chell Lindgren, and he is also commander of the Crew Dragon spacecraft. Chell is responsible for um, all phases of flight from launch to reentry, and this will be his second trip to space. Bob Hines is the pilot for the Crew Dragon spacecraft and second in command for the mission. He is responsible for the vehicle's uh, performance and systems, and this will be Bob's first trip to space. Jessica Watkins is a mission specialist for Crew-4. She will work closely with the commander and pilot to monitor the spacecraft systems during the dynamic phases of launch and reentry, and this will be Jessica's first trip to space. Samantha Christopher Reddy is also a mission specialist for Crew-4. She will work closely alongside Chell Bob and Jessica, and this will be Samantha's second trip to space. We will be taking uh, questions here in the room and on the phone, phone bridge and also through social media using the hashtag AskNASA. But before we get to questions, I would like to invite the Crew 4 Commander, Chell Lindgren, to make an opening statement. Take it away, Chell. Thank you, Dylan. Um, well, first of all, thank you to everyone that's uh, here in the room today and uh, joining us online and on social media. Um, it's really exciting to have this opportunity to kind of formally talk about what we're going to accomplish um, on the space station during this upcoming mission. You know, I know that I speak for the entire crew when we say that we are incredibly excited um, about this opportunity. It is such a privilege uh, to get a, to be a part of this team, and uh, and we're really excited about uh, um, launching and getting to the space station to, to conduct our mission. Um, this is an awesome crew, and uh, so so excited to, to be a part of this <laughs> this crew with uh, Samantha Farmer and Wadi, and uh, and then also to have the opportunity. I think Samantha and I are really excited about getting to see uh, Farmer and Wadi uh, launch for the first time, and just to see how they adapt to uh, to being in weightlessness and to Sorry. to kind of yeah, <laughs> to realize this uh, this life, lifelong dream. Um, we're ex excited about launching. Uh, on, a, on a U.S. rocket from Kennedy Space Center. Uh, both Samantha and I had the opportunity to launch previously. And, and so to do this from Kennedy Space Center, to have family and friends join us in that experience is really a remarkable thing. Uh, and we're excited to get to orbit and to conduct this mission, um, to conduct the science and research to improve life back here on Earth, uh, to conduct the operations to research to help us um, succeed in our mission to return to the moon and to go on to Mars and extend our presence in the solar system, to, uh, to do the maintenance and repairs uh, to ensure that we can uh, conduct safe operations on the space station, um, and really to serve uh, on a team that inspires the next generation for what is possible uh, to do when we work together as an international partnership. So we are really excited uh, to be at the end of our training flow and looking forward to our launch on, uh, on the 20th. Awesome, thank you, Chell. So we will go ahead and get started with questions here in the room on the phone and on social media. We'd love to take your questions um, on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Um, just a reminder to those on the phone, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your phone or star two if your question has already been answered. Um, a reminder to folks who are asking questions to the crew, we ask that you keep it to one question for the time being so that we can make sure that we have enough time for everyone and time permitting, uh, we will circle back for some follow-ups. So let's go ahead with some questions in the room. We'll start with Mark Corot. Thank you, Mark Corot for uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, could the appropriate ones talk about some of the spacewalk activity that's planned uh, or that you're prepared to do that could be, uh, you know, significant? 
Do you want to talk about sure. that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, as it tentatively stands, obviously with everything, uh, it's all subject to change. But as it stands right now, uh, we are slated for uh, two, uh, two U.S. EVAs. Uh, Samantha may get an opportunity to do a, a Russian EVA. Um, the U.S. EVAs are primarily focused on uh, continuing the uh, replacement or the modernization of the uh, solar array or the power system. Uh, for the space station, uh, what we call IROSA. And so our EVAs will be what we call IROSA prep, where we're installing um, these modification kits that uh, install brackets, which the actual IROSA solar panels will go, uh, will be installed on, on future EVAs. <clears throat> All right, continuing the questions, um, let's go to Gina Sinceri from ABC News. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Before we started, I noticed really, you guys seem to get along really well. So the, 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 the training, who wants to take this? How important is that camaraderie on a mission like this? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, it certainly is, is a big part of the kind of culmination of our training, especially. Our training kind of starts out, uh, we each kind of take on our training individually, um, where we kind of gain that foundation of skill sets on our own. And then towards the end of the, the, the flow, um, we start to come together and really get to practice those skills and apply them together um, in real scenarios. And so that has really been a joy for me and I think for all of us to really get to start to do some of that together, really get to know each other, spend some time together. Um, we even got to um, go out on a, um, a Knowles trip, so that's the National Outdoor Leadership School, um, and uh, do some sea kayaking out um, out in um, eastern Washington and just get to spend some time getting to know each other, understanding how we um, all function in an operational environment and, and what kind of makes each other tick. Um, and I think that's going to be really crucial on top of the, obviously, the operational side of, of what we do. Um, a big part of it is the teamwork and the uh, just the, the crew cohesion piece of being up on ISS. Yeah, I would say that's one of the most important things. You know, so NASA and our partners are really good about training us on the science, on the maintenance, and all the things that we need to accomplish. But uh, that uh, that team spirit, uh, that crew cohesion, I think is one of the things that you can't really train. And so uh, we've had a lot of trips out to, to Hawthorne, California, to train with SpaceX. And that's an opportunity when um, we, we have a chance to go out and have dinner together, uh, to train together, to bond. Uh, because that's what we carry into this mission. Uh, we get along uh, great. It is uh, uh, just such a joy to, to be with these, to have these folks um, on this team um, and to be a part of this team. And then to join the team that we have on the space station. Um, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, Sergey and Oleg and, and Dennis. Um, we had a chance to train and work with them. And that's what makes us successful, is, uh, is the teamwork and partnership. And, uh, and getting to work with a great group of folks, both on Space Station and also here on the ground. Thank you, Chell. Uh, we will go to Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hi, so I was hoping you could tell me um, why you chose the name Freedom for the capsule. And you know, based on the timing, I have to ask if, if it was inspired at all by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, also, if you could explain the nicknames you just kind of threw out for each other oh. as well. Thank you. <laughs> Question about names. <laughs> Um, I think that, uh, you know, for the name of the vehicle, we really want to celebrate the partnership um, of, of uh, SpaceX and NASA and what commercial, the commercial crew program has, uh, has, has brought to the table. Um, they have, uh, you know, we have resumed this ability to get our crew, our astronauts um, to low Earth orbit, and I think that's very important. Um, we want to celebrate what we see as a, as a fundamental human right, and that is, uh, and then also to, to celebrate, as we kind of put out in the statement, uh, what the unfettered human spirit is capable of. Um, and as also just kind of a reflection on how far we've come. You know, uh, Alan Shepard launched on a Mercury Redstone. There's one parked out on Rocket Park as you come into to, uh, Johnson Space Center, and to see that, um, that first launch of Freedom 7 and to see where we are today uh, is really a remarkable thing. And, uh, and so we wanted to celebrate freedom for a new generation of space flyers. And nicknames, right? Oh, yeah, nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I, I guess I'll take mine. So my uh, my call sign from the Air Force is uh, is farmer, and it has nothing to do with agriculture. Um, <laughs> the uh, I am actually named after a Russian airplane, which is the MiG-19, uh, and the NATO call sign for it is a farmer. And it's uh, it just stems. Most call signs have very little to do with something that you did well. Uh, and so uh, for me, on my first check ride in the F-15, I had a switch error where uh, I thought I had all these uh, simulated missile kills. Uh, and it turned out when we watched the tapes that I was in a guns mode the whole time. And so they named me after a Russian fighter that doesn't carry missiles. It only shoots guns. Uh, and so I'm named after the MiG-19 farmer. Wadi? <laughs> so. uh, yeah, mine, mine's pretty straightforward. Um, you'll, you'll hear these guys calling me Wadi uh, just based on my last name is Watkins. So. Good. I think that's all the nicknames. Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, so we are going to go ahead and t start taking some questions from the phone bridge. A reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press uh, star 1 to be added to the queue, or press star 2 if your question has already been answered. Um, for those on the phone, please also make sure to state your name and your outlet, and please um, state who your question is for. Um, so let's go ahead and take the first question from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. And Robert, if you are muted, we cannot hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, for the whole crew or whoever wants to take it, um, your crew patch sort of broke your tradition from the past and even future dragon crews, moving the large element from a depiction of a mythical dragon to a dragonfly. Can you share the development of the patch as a crew and if that uniqueness carries across to your personalities and approach as a as a crew together? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to share kind of the origination of that patch. Um, the, the dragon is such a neat concept, and uh, we really appreciate the kind of the lineage of, of patches from crew one, two, and, and three, and then also demo two. Um, but I think that we wanted to reconnect with the Earth in our patch, and uh, and so looked for some element that could do that. And what uh, what better element than a namesake of a dragonfly, um, a, nat a beautiful and agile flyer, and uh, and also you know in many cultures a sign of good fortune. And so um, we made that the centerpiece of our patch, and uh, and part of it also was as a. Uh, Kind of a call out to the launch team at Kennedy Space Center, the SpaceX team. The uh, the Dragonfly is is something of a um, I wouldn't say a good luck charm, but uh, it's something that has popped up um, before every uh, every launch out there. Remember during Demo Two, as the weather was kind of bad, a, a Dragonfly landed on on Doug's shoulder as they were getting out of the uh, the vehicles to go to the launch pad, and uh, and everybody kind of took that as a good sign. Um, I actually got to serve as an astronaut support person for Crew One's launch. I was out at the launch gantry and saw a Dragonfly land on the uh, the crew uh, the crew arm, and uh, and subsequent launches that I haven't been able to attend. Folks from the the support team has have uh, sent me photos of the Dragonfly as they as they have landed uh, in preparation for launch. So we really wanted to highlight uh, that aspect as well, and and then um, I think even better. Uh, the the uh, the patch was designed by my daughter, so uh, yeah, we were really excited about uh, the designs that she came up with. I didn't actually tell these guys uh, when I presented the art to them. I just said, "Hey, here's here's some some uh, versions of the patch," and I think we all fell in love. We we loved all of them, but really fell in love with the one that we ultimately went with, and uh, and we really appreciate the great response that the patch has had as well. I right. saw a, a dragonfly while we were walking in today, actually. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, nice. it's in good shape. And that's the other cool thing, is that there's something that, I mean, just like that, like yeah. as you're walking around, you see a dragonfly. It's, a it's something that just uh, warms your heart a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, we will take our next question from Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Describe um, for me, you're going to become the first black woman to move long term into, the, to, into any space station. What does it mean to you and others? Why do you think it's taken until 2022 to achieve? And Samantha, um, if you could also please talk about your take on being the lone woman in ESA's uh, astronaut corps. Thank you very much. Okay, I will start. Um, yes, yeah, so 
you know, this is certainly um, an important milestone, I think, uh, both for our agency and, and for the country. Um, and, you know, I think it really is just a tribute to the uh, legacy of the black women astronauts that have come before me, as well as to the exciting future ahead. Um, and so I'm just uh, honored to be a small part of that legacy moving forward. Um, you know, for me, um, growing up, it was important to me to have um, role models in roles that I aspire to be in, contributing in ways I aspire to contribute. Uh, so to the extent that I'm able to do that, uh, I am I'm honored and uh, grateful for the opportunity to return the favor. Uh, but we're just super excited to uh, be a part of this crew and uh, get to execute the mission together. Yeah, and uh, from my side, um, well, that um, condition that you mentioned about me being the um, uh, only woman in the European Astronaut Corps is bound to end very soon. And uh, we are in the process of selecting a new class of astronauts. We had a huge response uh, across all uh, ESA member states. I think we got well over 20,000 solid valid applications. Uh, we are well into that process of selection now. I think we got a great response also from young uh, female professionals across the, the continent uh, compared to my selection back in 2009 where female applicants were only about 15, 16%. I think we're uh, about 25% now. Uh, and so uh, we definitely expect to, to have some, uh, some great female colleagues uh, by, the, by the end of the year, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Paul Brinkman with Aerospace America. Uh, hi, yes, yeah, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, one of you, I guess, astronaut Lindgren, um, could you just talk about the fact that this is a, a new Dragon? Um, are you aware of any uh, new features that are on this Dragon um, that you know may have been added? Um, and then what your just what your training experience was like uh, training for the Dragon? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, the training experience has been phenomenal, and uh, and I have somewhat of a unique perspective as I, I kind of joined that team several years ago, almost four years ago, as the backup for Bob and Doug and as the backup for, for uh, Ike and Hopper uh, for Crew One. And so I've been working with that team, training with that team, a part of the test and development initially, and then um, really watch the training process mature over time. And so uh, it's been a lot of fun to go through that training formally uh, with this crew and, and to experience it firsthand. Um, in terms of new capabilities, uh, that is, I think, one of the really cool things that SpaceX uh, brings to the table is that they are constantly trying to improve and uh, to make things more efficient. Um, uh, they, I think, uh, the teams that we work with are always listening to our feedback and want to make things better. And so um, I, the, I think that uh, a couple of things that come to mind, one, you know, just in terms of our communications uh, system within the vehicle, uh, Vox is something that uh, controls kind of the, the level of static. And, and so we have some visual indicators of, of how to set that now that just kind of take the guesswork out and, and make things, I think we, maybe we save, save a couple of minutes, but those are important minutes and, and kind of minimize some frustration. Uh, that was great. I think our favorite thing, though, is uh, that we have USB charging ports uh, in the spacecraft. Um, this is something that goes to low Earth orbit and is going to get us to the space station. And I'm talking about USB ports. But um, yeah, it's the little things. Next coffee maker. No Wi-Fi, though. Um, so, but but uh, we have tablets as a part that have some of our reference material on it. And so the ability to charge those tablets uh, just, again, takes away this idea that we have to really monitor the use of the tablet to maintain the battery charging. And, and, uh, and so those USB ports actually came, uh, were a product of the Inspiration4 mission. And so some of their private missions um, have fed capabilities into the NASA missions. And, I, and again, I think that this is a, just really demonstrates the power um, and agility of, of this commercial partnership with uh, through the commercial um, crew program and the, the benefits that feed back to NASA as a result. 
Yeah, 100% agree. I, I had the opportunity to participate in some of the verification events early on as well, not quite as early on as Chell did. Uh, but uh, to watch the vehicle evolve over time uh, and see the improvements that they uh, have brought on board, uh, especially in the human factors realm, uh, their uh, willingness to, to listen, and even if we're just kind of spitballing uh, something that could be an improvement, uh, they'll come back to us a couple months later and say, hey, we heard you say this, and this is the thing we're working on. And, uh, and it's just it's been pretty amazing to to watch them and work with them and and really grow this partnership and see uh, see what we're able to do together. So it's been awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, our next question is going to come from Michelle with CBS Four News. Hi, I'm Michelle Griego with CBS Four in Denver, and I just. Um, I uh, want to congratulate all of you, but this question is for Jessica Watkins. Um, we are very excited that uh, somebody who is from Colorado is going up into space, and um, I just wanted to ask or wanted to see if you could just talk about your connection to Colorado. I know your family still lives here. And also, you touched on this historic mission and this important milestone for the agency and the country, but if you could just talk um, maybe to young girls out there who um, – are wanting to get into science and especially girls of color, how important that is and what the need is. Yes, absolutely. So yes, first of all, I'm super excited to represent Colorado with Chell as well. I attended CU. Um, but we, yes, um, my, my family, as you mentioned, lives in Boulder. Um, that's where I, I grew up, went to high school there, went to Fairview High School in Boulder. Um, and uh, Colorado has a, a pretty good showing in the astronaut corps, actually, um, with quite a bit of representation. So I'm um, happy to, to add my name to the list and, and try to represent you all well. Um, for your second question, um, yes, I certainly would encourage any young girls, um, young you know, children of color, young children in general, um, to, to find something that you love and just pursue that relentlessly. Um, for, for this job in particular, um, we're looking at the STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, uh, but anything within that realm. You know, that, that's actually a, a pretty broad category um, to find something that you really love and just seek out opportunities to, to do that. Um, for me, that often looked like internships. Um, I was involved in several NASA internships kind of throughout my career before arriving here, um, and NASA does a great job investing in their internship program, and that's just a allows you the opportunity to get to get hands on and get a little bit of experience um, while you're still in school and decide what it is that you really want to continue to pursue. Um, and I was really lucky to have those opportunities. So um, I would just say to, to any um, young people to, to find that thing that you love and, and continue working hard at it. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> Our next question comes from uh, Chelsea Goad at space.com. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Uh, yeah, Chelsea from space.com. Uh, you know, being crew four, you have uh, a really great and incredible group of astronauts that have come before you in flying dragons to the space station. Um, you know, whether that be you know, through these missions or through, as you mentioned, inspiration four. Have you been chatting with these other astronauts, with these former crews, and have they been giving you tips? Have you been working together? Uh, I'm curious what that collaboration has looked like in preparing for this mission. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. That is definitely uh, a very important part of uh, our training. It's not the formal training. That's the one that's like hard scheduled as classes with the instructor. But of course, it's also, as you say, very much important to learn from the experience of the crews that went before us. Uh, so when uh, Crew 2 came back, they went through a very rigorous process of debriefing their mission. And so we were always invited to participate in those debriefs. Unfortunately, we were also very busy with our own training so we couldn't always go. Uh, but uh, we made a point of having an informal like pizza evening with, with the crew a few weeks after their return, when it was all still fresh in their mind, and they could really pass on um, parts of, of that experience. 
a lot of it has been really how it is to, you know, the, the parts that are really a little bit more difficult to actually train in, in the formal training and the simulator. So how is it to live for a certain amount of time inside Dragon on the way to space station? How is the habitability of the vehicle? How do you actually sleep? How do you use the toilet? How do the, all those things, those practical things worked out? How about eating? How about stowage? Um, and so they, they give us um, a lot of tips. Uh, their feedback and their, uh, you know, the, the content of their debriefs informed also uh, a process of improvement. As, as Chell was mentioning earlier, it's a very agile program. So, you know, both the SpaceX team and the NASA teams involved in Dragon, they work really hard, you know, especially because it, it's still kind of the beginning of this program, it's still the early flights, to incorporate in the next flights uh, all that feedback that they got from the previous crews. And actually, just today, we had an opportunity to have a call with uh, Crew 3, with uh, the um, guys and girls who are up there on the space station, um, just for some you know, last minute tips from, from their side as they get ready to go into quarantine and get ready to launch in a few weeks. And then, of course, we'll have um, a lot of opportunities to um, get uh, their knowledge and expertise once we get on orbit and we have our handover period before they return. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. I think. Um in the, our previous experience of training, I found that spending time around a dinner table, talking with folks that were in training or just recently returned from flight, that, that uh, I think, and many people say it, is that's where you learn space flight, is in those kind of informal conversations. Um, just asking questions and, and the, uh, the opportunity to have a, just a conversation. Um, and people have amazing stories that really drive points home. And uh, you kind of tuck, I, know, I remember I was tucking those, those little uh, pearls away uh, for, for my own flight. And so I think that that's something that, that we really try, as the Knowles expedition that, that uh, Wadi talked about, really try to find opportunities where we can gather as our own crew and then uh, gather with uh, members of the, the team that works here in Mission Control or with our uh, international partners or our commercial partners, um, and then also to, to, to gather with uh, with other crews to be able to share kind of those tips and tricks. It's really, really important. Okay, our next question comes from Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media. Uh, good morning and uh, greetings from Alaska. This is Russell Pounds with Pacific Rim Media. And my question is for Jessica. Uh, I wanted to hear from you about mentors today. And you spoke about internships when you were older uh, a few minutes ago, but can you recall an early story about a person who helped you discover your inner explorer and what age that first took place? Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, mentors have, have always been kind of a, a force that has continued me along a pathway um, and helped me decide and determine what that pathway would be um, kind of along the way. Uh, but I think having different mentors, you know, of, of throughout your career is has been instrumental for me in terms of getting where I am today. Um, certainly, I've, I've had lot, many teachers, um, science teachers, of course, um, at a young age in, in elementary school. And um, I remember, again, a lot of those mentorships, again, came with opportunities to be able to go out on field trips or um, you know, go go look at interesting things in the lab that really kind of sparked my interest and uh, kind of fueled my fire along the way. Um, I also have have had many coaches um, along my kind of career, um, athletically as well as academically, that have also helped kind of guide me and shape me and mold me, if you will, as, as a whole human, um, which I think is a really important piece of what we do here now and also getting to, to be here is um, being able to have all aspects of yourself um, uh, be kind of diverse and um, making sure that you are involved in, in many different things so that your whole self is kind of being fed. Um, so I, those are those were definitely lessons that I've learned from mentors along the way, um, and I'm really grateful for, for all those people in my life. Uh, my family and friends as well. Hi, Mom. They made a, they made a great human. <laughs> I think that's one of the really cool things about uh, this, uh, you know, this career field especially, but, you know, there are lots of them out there, is the opportunity to reflect on 
uh, how you got here. And we get asked this question a lot, and it is uh, super humbling to be able to sit in a position like this and and reflect on those kinds of things and the people that that influenced you along the way and how many there are. There's the cast of thousands that not only take part in our training and preparing the vehicle and all of that kind of stuff, but also going all the way back to our childhood. Like everybody that we interacted with along the way was foundational in helping us to achieve this. And that's something that I know we talk a lot about is in some way finding a way to bring all of them along on this mission with us. Uh, and so all of you watching out there are part of this, and so you are 100% part of the Crew 4 uh, team. Absolutely. That is awesome. <laughs> That's where your name came, your class name came from, even. That's right. Girl. That's right. Yeah. All right. Our next question comes from David Curley with Discovery News. Thanks very much. Uh, David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Uh, for the spacewalkers, can you talk a little about, about the EMUs? They're long past their uh, sell by date. Uh, I would assume the practice suits at JSC um, might be a little bit more worn. Give us a sense of what it's like getting into one of these well-used suits. We talked about the water issue uh, in the last news conference uh, about the last spacewalk. And have any of you had anything to do with uh, XEMU uh, development? And can you tell us what you've told folks? Thank you. Uh, I'll just start out and say, um, you know, when you think about the EMU, this extravehicular mobility unit, uh, it is, I think, a modern miracle of engineering. Now, when you put this, uh, this spacesuit on, it is a miniature spacecraft. You know, we have a safety tether that hooks us, up, hooks us to the space station, but everything that we need to survive, um, water, cooling, or thermal protection, uh, an atmosphere, scrubbing carbon uh, dioxide, pro the provision of oxygen at appropriate pressure, um, all in a vehicle that is essentially molded to our bodies so that we're able to move around and do work. Um, it, is, it is incredible. And we are, we've been asking things of this spacesuit uh, that were never really expected when it was originally designed. Um, so it's a testament to the, to the original designers, a testament to the engineers that have continued uh, its operation, and a testament to the trainers who have um, taught us how to maintain the spacesuit uh, on orbit. Uh, you know, this was originally designed that after every spacewalk, after, well, after every mission to go back down, come back down here, get refurbished, and, uh, and then sent back up. And, and we keep these spacesuits on orbit uh, to, do, to do the work up there. Um, so it, uh, you know, it has uh, definitely been um, extended past kind of its original intention. But it, it, uh, it is still uh, an amazing piece of, of equipment um, that allows us to do incredible things outside of the space station. Uh, that being said, you know, we are about to, to um, I guess, I don't know how far we are from, from XEMU becoming um, operational, but this opportunity now to, to fold in new technologies and, um, and provide our, our crew members with new capabilities as we return to a rocky surface um, is really extraordinary. And so you, I don't have a whole lot of experience with XEMU. Do you? A little bit, yes. Uh, and I think that you know what you're kind of bringing up, Till, is really important. It's this, this idea of um, what we are able to do on ISS as a, as a proving ground or as a, a means of you know, uh, developing technology that is going to allow us to pave the way to Moon and Mars. And I think EMU, with the transition to XEMU, is an example of that, yeah. um, to just to enable us to be able to do, you know, real field work um, on, a, on a rocky surface, as you say. And as a, as a geologist, that's super exciting, <laughs> the idea of being able to bend down and pick up a rock. It sounds, <laughs> sounds very trivial, but it, it is, it is going to be very exciting in the science that we're going to get out things. of that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, we're very excited about it. That's awesome. Okay, um, our next question comes from Zachary Aubert with the Launchpad News. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the questions. And I can just say, we love the energy of this crew. You can just feel how much of a, a family you are. So we're excited to see you guys launch. Um, Jessica and uh, Robert, with this being your first space flight, is there something specifically you're most looking forward to? We've obviously heard the zero gravity or the view from previous astronauts on their first flight, but something you're looking to. And Chell and Samantha, you guys are getting to go back after quite a while, maybe something that you've been longing to get to experience again from your first flight. 
And we, we, it's always a big question, what's the zero-G indicator? You mentioned that your daughter helped design the patch. Has it already been decided, and were your kids part of that decision as a crew? It's classified. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, zero G indicator has been decided, and it uh, will be revealed at a later date. <laughs> um, the uh, yes, this is my first flight. Uh, Wadi's as well, and uh, obviously, uh, I'm sure we're both really excited. I, I'm really excited. This is a boyhood dream, uh, obviously, and so that whole culmination of that is really exciting. Uh, it's uh, we kind of talked about it earlier. It's kind of surreal to be in a position like this, but to to think ahead, it's 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 really hard on a first time flight, uh, at least for me, to think beyond the things that you talked about. Like the first thing I want to do when I get up there after Seco, uh, you know, once that engine cuts off, I want to unstrap and go look out the window, right? Like that's the that was part of what drove me to be a pilot. I love seeing things from a new perspective, uh, and this is kind of the ultimate uh, part of that is getting to look outside and see the see the earth and see this wonderful creation that we get to live on, seeing it from a new perspective and the beauty uh, that, that, it, that it displays every day. So really looking forward to that. And then getting onto space station, uh, certainly the people part of it. You know, the more we go through training, there's all the technical aspects of everything. But as you alluded to, our crew is awesome. We've got more awesome crewmates on orbit. We've got two more classmates on orbit uh, that we get to go overlap with for a little while. And the opportunity to just go do this incredible thing with people that we that we love is just awesome. And so we're really, really looking forward to, to spending time with everybody up there. Oh, all right. Anyone else? What Farmer said. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. I, would, I guess I would say for myself, uh, in terms of going back, um, really, really excited to, to be launching from Kennedy Space Center. You know, that uh, growing up and watching shuttle missions, being inspired by the, the images of our Apollo astronauts um, working on the moon, uh, to, to launch a mission from uh, from this historic site uh, to the ability to have friends and family just drive out to watch that launch um, and to be to experience part of um, this incredible privilege that we have of, of being part of the, the NASA and international partner team. Um, that is really exciting to me. This feels like a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so the privilege of getting to do it a second time is uh, is a little surreal. Yeah. All right, we are going to take our first question from social media before we go back to the phone bridge. A reminder, if you, if you are on the phone and you have a question, please press star one to be added to the queue, or star two um, if your question has already been answered. But um, we will take our first social media question now. Uh, Natalie on Twitter would like to know um, about any pre-flight traditions that the crew has. Well, Wadi and I are first-time flyers. We don't have any traditions. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about being a veteran flyer is that we get to make up traditions and tell them, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you like totally have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're on to us, though. I the think, rookies uh, have to get dinner for the <laughs> they pay, The rookies pay for everything. You didn't know that? Um, one tradition that uh, I actually had from my last mission was to launch uh, some model rockets with the family. And so I think that that's something that we'd like to do mm -hmm. as we are with our families um, at KSC getting ready uh, for our flight. Uh, just being on the beach and launching some model, ro model rockets together, I think, would, uh, is something that I think we're, we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I'm looking forward to learning about these uh, new traditions. I mean, on my first flight, um, just like Chell, uh, we flew out of uh, Baikonur, and uh, that's a place that's really steeped in traditions. <laughs> uh, it, it's almost like being part of this uh, ritual path towards launch. Like, you know, as, as you approach launch, you just really go through those milestones that every other crew has gone through since, you know, possibly Yuri Gagarin. Um, and, 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 and I like that. I mean, it, it was, uh, I think in some ways it took the, the burden away of this uh, momentous event that was coming. You know, you, you got excited about it, but because you were going through this, all this ritual uh, steps, uh, it, it kind of felt, yeah, ritualized. You know, it, it felt like you were just repeating like something that had happened before. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think uh, from Canada it will be very much the same, but it's my first time launching from there. And so, just like you, I'm looking forward to discovering those traditions. 
And I think the prior crews, having you know worked with Bob and Doug and Ike and Hopper and some of the subsequent crews, they really felt that they recognized that this is a historic thing that we're embarking upon. You know, launching and a new rocket. Uh, and so I think that we they thought a lot about hey, what are some previous traditions, and do we do we borrow from those, and do we borrow from our Soyuz experience too? Because that's very much a part of our our spaceflight experience. And so I think that we've tried to introduce new traditions as we've gone along, and yeah. and then I think we've heard that some crews have done some things, and we're like, yeah, I don't think we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you know, as a first time flyer, the whole the I mean, launching from KSC is a tradition in and of itself uh, for us. And so the opportunity to go do that is pretty amazing. I remember my first time being at the Cape and uh, going into crew quarters. And I was with, a, uh, I actually wasn't an astronaut at the time. I was a, an instructor pilot. And we were in crew quarters. And we dropped a bunch of bags off. And we ran back outside. And everybody got in the rental cars. And I had this surreal moment of like those are the those metal doors I just walked through are the doors that the, I've seen the watched the astronauts come out and get in the Astro van from and I just had this moment where I'm like somebody has to take my picture in front of this door right now and they're like we're hungry get in the car uh, and so like just being part of that whole process of launching from the Cape and the history that is down there is just amazing and so it's really exciting to get to be a part of that. Thank you. Um, we are going to go back to the phone br uh, back to the phone bridge. Uh, we'll, we will take a question from Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Um, hello. You've all been talking about camaraderie and teamwork. Um, and I was just wondering, um, there's also this situation on the ground in Ukraine where the United States and Russia are on opposite sides. I was wondering how you approach this when you're up in space on and you, this is a situation you have no control over. Um, is this something you would, a topic you would just avoid talking about, especially with your Russian colleagues? Or would you look to have discussions and get possibly a different view? Thank you. Yeah, that's an, an important question. Uh, we are certainly not immune to the, the geopolitical situation right now. Um, these are very challenging times. Um, but we are, this is our job. And we've been uh, given the privilege of of this mission, going to the space station, uh, maintaining its operation, and conducting the science and research uh, that so many uh, from around the world have invested in, and, and creating that operational bridge for the programs in front of us, uh, Moon and Mars. And uh, so we take that very seriously. Uh, thousands of people have invested uh, so many hours in our training. Um, and so we very much look forward to, to getting on orbit and working with our, our Russian colleagues, uh, our friends up there, in having a safe and successful mission and getting everybody um, back home safely. So I think that uh, we will do the things that need to be done to, to make sure that we can, we can do that safely and efficiently. Uh, all the Sergey and Dennis are amazing um, space flyers. We've had the opportunity to train with them, to, to have uh, meals with them. And, uh, and we very much look forward to, to working with them on orbit. OK, we are going to go back to social media. A reminder, if you have any questions for us on social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA to send those to us. Right now, I have a question from Basil Frankweiler, who is a fourth grader. And he asks, um, will you be eating the chili peppers on the station that the last crew uh, What's the shelf life What's of the <laughs> <laughs> But will, will you be eating the, the produce that is grown on the space station? Yeah, I think, I think unfortunately there are no peppers left yeah, because I think after taco okay. night Maybe. with uh, crew yeah, three, I think, I think, they're, they're, they're think may, they maybe uh, have completed their harvest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> will you be growing any, any new plants? So there, the is, uh, there is a uh, yep. payload up there. Um, I got to participate in that last time. Uh, it was a project called Veggie where we grew red romaine lettuce and our crew was actually the first uh, U.S. crew to grow um, and, and eat a crop. And that is an amazing thing, to get to care for um, a plant, to, to plant it, and then to watch it grow to the size um, that it can be harvested, uh, to recognize that this could be in a really important part of future spaceflight as, um, as a source of food and even as a part of our environmental control system. Um, and to recognize, you know, to, to see this part, uh, a little part of what science fiction has described for a long time, uh, and to be a part of that. And, that. and then to have that as, as a part of a meal was really a, a lot of fun. Um, we have 
I think kind of a, I mean, it's been seven years since I flew, and so those projects have uh, continued to the point now where we're looking at different ways of growing plants, and we'll be doing that. I think the project's called X Roots. Yes. X Roots, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so, aeroponic and hydroponic uh, strategies for growing plants. Um, I'm really excited to hear what we're going to be growing. I'm a little bummed that we missed out on the peppers, yeah. but uh, I know that you're really bummed too, Jessica. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited. And so this is a really cool thing about the science that we do on station is that uh, you can see um, the, a lot of the benefits and how they help us extend our presence in the solar system and enable our future exploration and also how the, the applications that they have for the earth. You know, uh, we recycle uh, 95, almost over 95% of our water. And we can see how that has direct benefits to, to Earth and the provision of clean water to communities that don't have access to it. Um, the ability to grow uh, plants and crops, you know, without and without arable soil, uh, I think that we can see th those benefits as well. And uh, and then to imagine crews someday having a whole module dedicated to to the growth of, of uh, edible plants is, is really a cool thing. And I just kind of imagine floating into that and being surrounded by green um, and, and breathing in that natural air is, is really cool, so. Absolutely. Um, we have another question from Twitter that is also about life on the space station. Uh, Karen asks how often um, station astronauts are allowed to talk to loved ones. I haven't been there yet, but I'm told. Uh, <laughs> uh, so coming out of the military, one of the things that I've identified uh, you know, in terms of, I guess, my baseline for what I know of keeping in touch with family was we would get one 15-minute phone call every week, and it was monitored, and there was somebody that would come on every five minutes and give you a countdown, and then the last minute. Uh, and uh, it is not at all like that. Um, and, and from my understanding is it's even better from when these two were up there, you know, when they had to walk uphill both ways uh, in, in the snow to get the station. But, um, but we have an IP phone. We're able to call our families pretty often. Uh, and then we get uh, roughly once a week uh, the opportunity to have a video conference with our families uh, back home, which I think is uh, really, really important. It's a good way to stay connected. Everybody is familiar with the different video chat uh, type technologies that are out there. And so to be able to have that and still stay, I have, I have three daughters at home, and so to be able to stay connected with them and, you know, maybe they'll carry around the iPad a little bit while they're doing something, hopefully not swimming. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to just stay connected with the things that are going on at the house uh, is pretty special. And so it, um, I, I think it will be, I'll find it easier than uh, the military deployments that we did, definitely. We certainly get truly spoiled by the ground team here at, at JSC yeah. and, and across NASA. Um, they take really good care of us, and uh, we're super lucky to, to be a part of that team. Yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, um, I think now we will take one more follow-up from the phone bridge. Uh, we will pass it to David Curley from Discovery Channel. Thank you very much for the uh, second question. Chael, this is for you. Uh, it's going to sound like a follow-on from... And Chang's question about Ukraine, but it's really not. It's it's about space culture. Christina Cook has talked a little bit about this. Can you? And secondly, did you pick the picture with the straight face in the crew photo? <laughs> Man, I have gotten so much grief Man. from these guys. I know. You planted that question, didn't you? <laughs> of the four of us, the one person who's not smiling should not be tell. That's the hilarious part about it. Um, I did pick that picture. I don't know. I didn't like the pictures of me smiling. So, and I asked my wife, and she's usually, I mean, she she gave me a thumbs up. So, it's the most important one. I know. I know. The, uh, yeah, my wife said that it was good. So, you guys will all have to yeah. deal with it. <laughs> That's right. Um, and I missed the first half of that question. The culture. The culture. Oh, yeah. We we get to. I mean, that, that that's one of the cool things about this is that that we are a part of that culture and of course as new um, newcomers to the station when we arrive there is a culture that is, has been established by the team that is all, already there and and so of course we want to be good team members and we want to respect the culture that has been has been established um, for my past flight when I arrived uh, Scott Kelly was already on station so he really kind of established the culture that uh, Kimia, my Japanese crewmate, and I um, came into. And it was, and it was great, you know. Uh, 
this time around, we will be coming into in a culture that's into a culture that's been established by Crew Three and our Russian crewmates. Uh, but within a few days, you know, Crew Three will leave, and so we'll have the opportunity to make decisions about, hey, um, we really want to eat to get you know, eat lunch together, and so let's ask the ground about trying to get our schedules situated so that we can do that, or. Uh, we really want to protect this time. And so I think that, that we've gotten to know each other really well, and I think that, uh, that uh, we'll make some um, decisions along the lines of what we think works best for our crew and works best um, with, our, uh, with our Russian colleagues as well. And we have the privilege of, of Samantha serving as our uh, USOS lead during this mission, and so I know that, um, that she's going to be talking with the ground and, and kind of advocating for a, for a lot of those things as we're um, as we progress through our mission. You know, cultures are malleable and changeable, and so I think that we have this unique um, opportunity to, to adjust that to make sure that we're working efficiently and, um, and having a good time while we're doing it. Thanks, Joel. Um, all right, I think we have some time for a few follow-ups here in the room, so we'll go to Mark Crow. Thank you, Mark Crow, Aviation Week. Um, in December of 2020, two of you were selected for the Artemis team, and I'm wondering uh, what this mission means to you and that prospect in the years ahead. Thank you. I think three of you were selected for Artemis. Two. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, no worries. Um, yes, no, so certainly, you know, we kind of touched on how this mission and how the, the mission of the ISS overall um, really is kind of paving the way to enable um, the success of the Artemis program. Um, certainly in terms of technology, developing um, robotics and um, other technologies that will, will allow that, um, including thinking about radiation protection. Um, those are experiments that are ongoing on station to, to help solve that problem, um, as well as kind of the operational capabilities, learning um, how to work together on board, but also with the ground team, especially a ground team that might be a little bit less accessible um, than the one is currently for us um, on ISS. So that's um, an ongoing kind of question and, and something we're pursuing as well. Um, and then there's the human research aspect as well. So um, getting to do science on ourselves, on each other, um, and <laughs> learn, <laughs> yes. um, Trust me. You know, learn how the, the human body um, responds to long duration spaceflight um, and ways that we can help mitigate any, any um, negative effects. Um, so thinking about exercise, for example, we've, mm. we've made huge gains in terms of reducing bone loss when we return from Earth, uh, return to Earth, those types of things. So mm -hmm. I think all of those kind of incremental, inter incremental progress that we have made over the course of ISS and that we'll contribute to during our mission uh, will really enable us to be successful in Artemis. And what, I mean, what an amazing time to be a part of NASA. Like we, I feel like we won the lottery. We, uh, we have a program, I mean, we have Artemis and we have Orion and we have a human landing system programs that are that are figuring out ways to get our astronauts um, and our partners to the moon and, and landing on the moon and, and with Mars in our sights. Um, you know, there, I think there, there's kind of a running joke that Mars is always 30 years away. And I have felt that horizon shrink um, considerably. And, uh, and so that is incredibly exciting. I mean, we have uh, served as an infrastructure for a commercial program, and now we have I mean, it just seems like there are rock, <laughs> rocket companies launching yeah. uh, every week and uh, a robust program to get cargo to the space station. Uh, and, and all these commercial companies that are vying to be a part of our return to the moon. Yeah. Uh, so it's an extraordinary time to be here. Um, it's so exciting to see all the, the activity um, that's going on. And, and now to, to get to go to the space station and really be the eyes and hands uh, for the team that is figuring these things out, figuring out this path and the technologies that are required to go to get back to the moon and to go on to Mars is is really extraordinary. Yeah, the um, you know historically you look at it and we were a very uh, we were a strand of things, right? Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Apollo, uh, Apollo, Soyuz, and then shuttle. And now it's, it's a like, web, yeah. right? Like it is a web. Uh, space industry is just incredible. Uh, and you know, as NASA pivots to the moon and Mars, uh, that pivot point is space station, all right? So all that yeah. technology is going to space station where we develop it and refine it before we pivot and send it off to the moon and then eventually to Mars. So it's, uh, it's an incredible time to be here. Awesome. Uh, 
and that, that will all be illustrated uh, quite profoundly when we get to watch Artemis One launch yeah. from, yeah. from on board. Yeah. So, so if yeah. you guys can put in a plug so that our you know it just works out that we're over yeah. Florida somewhere yeah, when an Artemis launches, yep. that would be awesome. Yeah. I'd watch that. <laughs> that would be so amazing. Would yeah. That would be amazing. That was one of the coolest things, actually, during my last mission. Um, our uh, pointing folks and and um, the folks that are kind of tracking our, our orbital path would send up notes saying, hey, we have a Soyuz launch or, or a Progress launch or a Cygnus launch. If you look out this window at this time, you should be able to see it. And I never really thought that that was possible, that you could actually see those launches. And yet one night, so um, we knew that there was a progress launch. It was dark over Kazakhstan. We all got into the cupola together and we're watching the ground. And I mean, sure enough, we, we saw a little dot kind of where we thought Baikonur would be. And then we saw that, that light blossom. And then we saw that light climb into, climb off the ground and you could see the illumination from the rocket um, below it, and it just absolutely blew my mind that we could see that with our with our own eyes, hmm. and then just watch that dot climb up, and and we had passed over the top at that time, and watch watch it climb up uh, through the horizon. Um, that was that was profound, and so if we get to see Artemis do that, that would be Pretty amazing. Epic. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait for you guys to come back with more of those stories. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have time for one more question from Gina Sinceri at ABC News. Uh, this is for Samantha. Um, you're going on a spacewalk. Will you wear a U.S. suit, a Russian suit? And if I remember correctly, your gloves were on the Cygnus that blew up. Did they ever replace your spacewalking gloves, and who did? Uh, so there's a little bit of conflation of, of aspects there. Uh, so I have now trained in the EMU on uh, this training floor. I have only trained in the um, Russian uh, spacewalking suit. It's called Orlan. Uh, the gloves are not mine, like for life. They were like my gloves back then, but then they've been used by other crew members. I, I actually know for a fact that Anne McLean has used those gloves, which was kind of excited. <laughs> uh, we, we are like uh, glove twins, I guess, or, or hand twins. Uh, but maybe other crew members have. I mean, they're definitely not like my gloves. Um, but yeah, so but this on, on this specific flight, if I get to do a spacewalk, which was. 100% not sure, then it would, uh, it could only be a, um, a spacewalk in the Russian or land suit. Which is pretty amazing. That, I mean, that she yeah. is she is trained in the U.S. system with the the our EMU, and is now trained and, and certified to fly the Orlan system. Um, is is an amazing thing. Not many so people cool. that are dual qualified. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, folks, that's going to be all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you to the Crew 4 for joining us today. Thank you to everyone in the room, on the phone, and on social media who s sent us your questions. Please make sure to tune in to watch these astronauts launch on the Crew Dragon Freedom from Kennedy Space Center to the International Space Station on April 20th. You can tune in on NASA.gov, the NASA TV app, um, as well as uh, all of the NASA, uh, NASA social media channels. That's going to conclude today's press conference. Thank you and have a wonderful day.